international youth clinical, youth clinical youth in 2010, a fresh treatment of youth tension tube of such disease. The balloon needs to be placed in the nasal orifice of the inner tube with the cooperation of sinus endoscopy. The sinus endoscopy is a balloon needs to be inside into the nasal cavities in parallel nerves. Sometimes the operation is affected by narrowing of the nasal cavities. Lack of direct visualizations, it is impossible to obtain emerge in the ear staging tube. The signal endoscope is a thick diameter and it cannot be banked and cannot enter the ear staging tube. At present, there is no other endoscope that can meet this need. Blue catheter is easy to be diamond because you can see the bloom in the you can see the bloom in the ascending tube. The practice is not. Uh, Ah, one moment. Ah, sorry. The fracture is not easy to find, resulting in surgical failures and worse of consumable. The decisive ideas realize the visualizations in the inner scope. Yeah, yes, hanging tube. Soft and hard compared with the endoscope. The black part, the back part of the is the is the scope is a hard segment endoscope. And the floor end is a soft segment endoscope, which can be banked into the yes, tension tube. Set a dilated bloom at the front of one end of the soft segment endoscope. The bracket part can be seen under the ear extension tube radio endoscope. And then push the balloon into the ear extension tube. The length and diameter of the balloon is consistent with the traditional balloon. After dilatation, the ear extension tube dilation Relative effects can be checked by extension by extension tube radio endoscope. Realize one hundred million and balloon put in. The components, including one endoscope of the extension tube, which is one zero uh, two millimeters diameter, one endoscope protective. Sleeve, one shirt tuber at different angles, uh, 50 degree, 45 degree, and 65 degree, 3.5 millimeters diameters, and one bring catheters. The broom is put on the endoscope, then put on the shirt, connected the core light source and connects it into camera systems. The back end of the uh, balloon is connected to the pressure pump. Uh, here's uh, four uh, pictures. The A is show a carrier series of the ES tension tube with your endoscope. Uh, B is catheter channeling the angle of the ES tension tube with your endoscope. So uh, judgment. The C is comparing compilation model of the yes, tension tube with your endoscope and yet supporting broom. The angle of the supporting broom can change with the yes, tension tube with your endoscope according to the catheter use. Uh, the, the below is the end of the equipment. Use and operation murders. 
one hand operations. The left ear standing tube with the left hand and the right ear standing tube with the right hand. Connecting between endoscope and camera systems. The endoscope pulling and shows tuber are fresh and sent from the nasal cavities on the dilatation site. After seeing the pharyngeal extension tube orifice, put the shelves into the extension tube under the guidance of endoscopies for examination. And from the black part of the extension tube, push the endoscope and the brain for worse and dilations was implemented using cholerized uh, solutions up to the pressures of 10 pounds, 10 parts for two minutes. After dilatation is complete, the inner extension tube can be checked again. There is the frozen discovery, a total of one uh, cadaver, cadavers under one ear tension tube radio endoscope examination and prolonged dilations ear tension uh, tube plastic of the cartilages portion of their ear tension tube. Two tests will carry out a different literary ear tension tube of the same bodies. The result, cadaver, uh, cadaver. The first picture is the nasal pharynx and ear tension tube orifice into the fields of rinsing. The two picture is the ear tension tube is completely open after the single uh, dilatations. Three picture is into the deep of the ear tension tube for examination. There is some water accumulate, accumulations, and the force we suctions the to clean up the water in the extension tube. And after cleaning up the accumul accumulate waters, check the extension tube. The Last is the uh, pictures we uh, sorry, uh, uh, we uh, carry out demand in inspections in the character during the regression process. The result category two. Enter the right. There were nasal cavities for fun to find the pharyngeal extension tube orifice. The two pictures pharyngeal tube orifice into the field of the vision. Three is extension tube cavities of the First, the dilation. The fourth is the second dilation of the, and the five is examination. And the last is check the diamond to in next words of the nasal cavities during the regression process. Now here's a video. So we use the uh, endoscope to see the learning, learning endoscope uh, only face a uh, year second tube. We find a broken 
and protein and put the endoscope inside and then it dilatations. Put the inner cell inside. When we uh when we uh perform the dilatations, we can't see the uh the effort of the uh gestation tube. We can see the the uh, suction suction the water and then check the gestation tube again. And we see the book is disease, is a point. Uh, we can see the cartilages of the ear standing tube. This is the deep of the ear standing tube. And check the diamond, there is no diamond of the uh, come and check it again. Okay. The other the advantage and such advantage of products use, the back end of the ear tension tube with your endoscope is a hard milling. The front end is a soft milling, which can be angular and it connects to add the endoscope into the ear tension tube. The diameter of the ear tension tube with your endoscope lens is 102 uh, millimeters, which can direct the inter the ear staging tube cavities to observe the situation of the ear staging tube. The supporting bullion can be slave on the ear staging tube with your ear endoscope soft segment and use with the catheter bullion along the ear staging tube with your ear stop soft uh, segment to the appropriate position of the ear tension tube. When the ear tension tube is observed to be broken and directs a profound bullion dilation. After bullion is dilation, the ear tension tube can be checked again and observes the dilative effect. The bullion catheter is of good strength. If it is put on the endoscope, there will be no fractures. The front, front end of the endoscope is flat. It is a circulate uh, angle, and it is not easy to diamond the commutus of the ear sensitive tube. Endoscope is a pulling, pulling in the achieve one hand operation and the operate process is convenient. The insufficient is yes, because the front, front end soft segment is a fiber medium, the clean radius is slightly poor. And the first time user is a scaly, scaly process. Uh, thank you for your attention. That was an excellent presentation, sir. Thank you.
Q for enlightening us with use of endoscope combined with eustachian tube balloon with clearly demonstrated procedure with pictorial representation. I appreciate your efforts, sir. So now the session is uh, open for question answers. So audiences can ask any queries to sir and let us discuss on this topic for a few minutes. Sir, how many maximum attempts did you do for uh, complete uh, dilation of Eustachian tube openings, sir? Um, here is a uh, uh, lens uh, cavity, a lens uh, cadavers, and we use in the uh, clinicals for, for about 10. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Sundar Bukya. Uh, currently, I'm a postdoctor fellow at uh, University of Hyderabad. Uh, I've completed my PhD in uh, cognitive sciences. Uh, my uh, research interests are uh, speech perception and uh, cognitive sciences. So this particular paper uh, we are, uh, you know, forthcoming is, uh, the first author is uh, Niranjan Kumar, who is an assistant professor at uh, Mehta College of Special Education in India. And the second author is uh, S.B. Ratna Kumar, who is an uh, associate professor at uh, University of Hyderabad. And the third author is me, is uh, Dr. Sundar Bukhya. So the title of uh, this research paper is uh, that uh, measuring cochlear implant uh, satisfaction in adults with uh, postlingual hearing impairments. So the satisfaction beyond uh, communication abilities. So this is the uh, title of our paper. So uh, coming to introduction, uh, first of all, uh, cochlear implants ha have revolutionized the auditory, you know, rehabilitation for individuals with, you know, uh, severe to profound uh, uh, sensor neural uh, hearing loss. While uh, initial satisfaction with uh, cochlear implant uh, outcomes was modest, uh, you know, expectations have uh, risen, particularly in developing countries like India, where, you know, individuals contribute to the cost of uh, implantation or rehabilitation. So the assessing of uh, cochlear implant uh, satisfaction is crucial for, you know, understanding the overall effectiveness of uh, cochlear implantation, you know, beyond uh, speech perception and uh, improvements. So this study basically aims to, you know, dwell deeper into the uh, nuanced aspects of uh, cochlear implant satisfaction among adults, you know, with uh, uh, post-lingual hearing impairment. Uh, by exploring these factors beyond speech perception improvements, the study seeks to, you know, provide insights into uh, broader uh, impact of cochlear implant on, you know, recipients' lives and you know, to inform uh, interventions aimed at, you know, enhancing overall uh, satisfaction and uh, the quality of life. So coming to the background of this study, uh, cochlear implants uh, provide significant uh, benefits in speech perception and communication abilities for, uh, you know, individuals with uh, uh, severe to profound uh, sensor neural uh, hearing loss. However, uh, the level of satisfaction among uh, cochlear implants recipients may not solely, you know, depend upon uh, improvements in speech perception. Factors such as uh, cost, service quality, uh, negative experiences, and you know, self-image also influence uh, cochlear implant satisfaction. So basically, it contributes to the understanding of cochlear implant uh, satisfaction by you know, examining various factors beyond uh, speech perception, you know, by adopting a patient-centered approach 
and utilizing uh, comprehensive uh, assessment tools. Uh, the study, you know, also seeks to provide a nuanced uh, understanding of satisfaction among uh, cochlear implant uh, recipients with postlingual uh, hearing impairment. So the objectives of this uh, study are, you know, the first uh, objective is to you know, measure the cochlear implant satisfaction in adults uh, with postlingual hearing impairment, and uh, to assess the satisfaction behind uh, beyond communi communication abilities, um, considering the factors uh, such as positive effect, uh, cost, and service and sometimes negative factors and, uh, and, and you know, self-image. And to examine the relationship between satisfaction and uh, duration of uh, deafness and uh, implant age. So these uh, objectives guide the research uh, into, you know, uh, methodology of uh, the, uh, present study, which aims to, you know, contribute the existing literature on the cochlear implant satisfaction. So by uh, addressing these objectives, uh, the study you know, seeks to advance our understanding of uh, satisfaction with cochlear implants and inform uh, you know, clinical practice to better meet uh, the needs of the cochlear implant recipients. So coming to the methodology uh, of this study, uh, the participants uh, were Indians, were uh, 30 postlingual adults with you know uh, bilateral uh, severe to profound uh, sensory neural hearing loss uh, using unilateral cochlear implants. Mm. The measurement tool is again satisfaction with amplification in daily life a questionnaire, which we have uh, designed uh, according to our way. And the assessment is uh, the questionnaire administered the uh, measure of satisfaction across you know four domains. Uh, positive effect, negative uh, features, cost and service, and, you know, personal image. In the coming to data analysis, the comparison of uh, satisfaction scores uh, based on the duration of deafness and implant uh, age. So the coming to uh, results uh, of this research, uh, it, it is quite interesting. Uh, especially in Indian patients, where uh, the participants reported satisfaction with you know cochlear implant uh, performance across all domains measured by our uh, measured through our questionnaire. So the satisfaction was uh, observed in terms of uh, positive effects, uh, cost, service, negative factors, and you know self image. And there is no uh, significant difference uh, found in satisfaction levels uh, between groups based on you know implant age or duration of deafness. So to discuss these results, the findings suggest that you know cochlear implant recipients experience uh, you know satisfaction beyond uh, improvements in speech perception. Um, factors such as cost, service, quality, and self-image contribute to the overall satisfaction with, you know, cochlear implants. And uh, the lack of uh, significant difference based on the, uh, you know, implant age or duration of deafness highlights the importance of personalized rehabilitation and support to the cochlear implant uh, recipients. To conclude uh, these results, um, cochlear implant satisfaction in adults with, you know, postlingual hearing Impairment extend beyond you know communication abilities, positive effects, cost and service, uh, negative factors, and uh, self image uh, play significant role in you know determining the satisfaction levels. And the understanding these factors can you know aid the optimizing rehabilitation strategies and uh, improving the overall quality of life for you know uh, uh, cochlear uh, implant recipients. Future studies, if you can talk about them, uh, the future research uh, indeed to you know explore the additional factors influencing uh, cochlear implant satisfaction, such as uh, social support, uh, psychological well-being can be studied, and the longitudinal uh, studies can be provided insights into stability of satisfaction levels uh, over time and 
you know the impact of evolving expectations on cochlear uh, implant outcomes can be studied uh, in, in the future so let me give you a, a disclaimer on this uh, we haven't you know shown our uh, complete uh, results and complete uh, data uh, part once the paper gets published we will we are going to you know uh, make it public but for now we have uh, discussed uh, um, through only you know, uh, without um, clear data so thank you today i'm going to present on the topic of rare case report of an impacted foreign body sewing needle in the upper neck Sorry. Yeah. So to uh, start with the introduction, the penetrating neck injuries require emergency treatment. So basically, uh, anatomically, the neck can be divided into three major zones. Zone one is below the level of cricoid cartilage. Zone two is the area between cricoid cartilage and the angle of mandible. And zone three includes area above the level of angle of mandible. Among these, injuries to anatomic zone two are the most common, constituting about 42% of the neck injuries. So in our present case, there was an injury in anatomic zone two. This zone contains vital structures such as internal and external carotid arteries, jugular veins, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, recurrent laryngeal nerve, spinal cord, trachea, thyroid, and parathyroid glands. So the foreign body in this case was a sewing needle which was embedded at the level of C1 and C2 cervical vertebrae with close proximity to internal jugular vein, piercing its adventitia, but leaving the lumen intact. So our case was of a 19 year old female who was brought to the otorhinolaryngology department. She had a history of pain over the right side of the neck below the angle of mandible, following a fall on a pin cushion after a fight with her brother one day back. The patient had no significant past medical history. On clinically examining the patient, she was conscious and oriented to time, place and person. She was hemodynamically stable without any focal neurological involvement, but tenderness was present around the wound site. Here we can see there is a small abrasion of about four into three millimeters, two centimeter below the mandibular body margin at the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It is marked with a black arrow. The patient came with only this abrasion, abrasion wound. Then we proceeded on to make a diagnosis for the patient we did a plain radiograph neck lateral view, which showed a radio-opaque linear shadow marked with a black arrow on the right side of the neck at the level of C1 and C2 vertebrae. Then we proceeded with a contrast enhanced CT scan with 3D reconstruction, which showed a linear needle-like radio-opaque shadow at the level of C1 and C2 cervical vertebrae with craniomedial angulation approximately 1.6 cm deep from the skin. It was seen traversing just anterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and probably piercing through or posterior to the deep lobe of parotid gland involving the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. At the tip of the level of tip of the right transverse process of C1 vertebrae as seen in the picture, it was crossing anterior to the internal jugular vein and compressing the IGV between the needle and the vertebra. So it was in close proximity to the internal jugular vein 
but the lumen was still intact. There were no signs of injury to cranial nerves 9th, 10th and 11th lying in front of the C1 and C2 vertebrae. There was no evidence of hematoma and the carotid vessels appeared normal. After making the diagnosis, we proceeded with the treatment part. The patient was admitted to the ward preemptive of an urgent surgical exploration of the foreign body under general anesthesia by an open lateral cervical approach. Multiple C-arm x-rays were done to locate and confirm the site of the foreign body intraoperatively. So this is an intraoperative picture taken with a C-arm x-ray to locate the foreign body. Approximately three centimeter incision was then made two finger breaths below the angle of mandible at the level of anterior margin of the sternocleidomastoid muscle on the right side as it has been marked in this diagram after confirming with the C-arm x-ray. So we can see the angle of mandible marked and two finger breaths below it there is the abrasive wound from where we have to make the incision. Skin and subcutaneous tissues were dissected and retracted. The sternocleidomastoid muscle was retracted posterior laterally and the posterior belly of digastric muscle superiorly. During the dissection, the hypoglossal nerve was identified medial to the posterior belly of digastric muscle. Then digital palpation was done to ensure the correct site of the impaction. There was no hematoma collection at the operative site. The foreign body that was a sewing needle was found to be embedded in the soft tissue approximately 1.6 cm deep to the skin, lying in juxtaposition with the internal jugular vein, piercing its adventitia, though the lumen was not entered. There was no damage to any of the vital vascular structures, and a foreign body, a 2.8 cm long sewing needle was removed very carefully. A small corrugated drain was kept in position. The neck wound was closed in layers. So this is a picture of the foreign body that we had removed after the emergency surgical exploration. So the outcomes was the patient's post-op recovery was uneventful and the sutures were removed after one week of antibiotic treatment and the patient was discharged. Then the patient came for a follow-up one week after the discharge from the hospital in the OPD setup. She had a healthy incision site, no pain or tenderness at the incision site. So the takeaway lesson that we got was due to early diagnosis, management, and a team of experienced surgeons, anesthesiologists, and support staff, any morbidity and mortality to the patient was avoided. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Sundar Kukia. I'm a postdoctor at uh, University of Canada. So this is our another research paper. Uh, our first author is uh, Dr. S. B. Ratna Kumar. He is an associate professor at the uh, University of Canada. Uh, the second author is me, Sundar Bokim. And third author is uh, Manish Kumar Gupta. He is an audiologist at the Department of ENT uh, Western Government Hospital. So our paper uh, title is uh, Speech Perception Performance in Sloping High Frequency Hearing Loss and uh, Frequency Lowering Strategy in Digital uh, Hearing Aids. It is a case report. Um, yeah. So the importance of speech per perception, if we discuss, the speech perception is basically uh, crucial for effective communication. Uh, it is essential for daily interactions, uh, social engagements, and uh, professional activities. 
So difficulties in speech perception can lead to uh, communication barriers, uh, reduce quality of life. So sloping high frequency uh, sen sensor neural hearing loss, uh, it, it is a typical hearing loss where higher frequency sounds are more difficult to hear than lower frequency sounds. And it also affects the ability to hear the uh, consonants more than vowels. So common in uh, uh, older uh, patients, often due to age-related changes or noise exposure. And it leads to uh, difficulties in understanding speech, uh, especially in noisy environments. So the role of hearing aids is, uh, you know, designed to amplify sounds to uh, improve hearing. Conventional uh, amplification increase uh, in the volume of sounds. Uh, advanced strategies like nonlinear uh, frequency compression enhance the perception of uh, you know high uh, frequency sounds and the conventional aids uh, helps with loudness uh, while advanced uh, strategies aim to improve the speech clarity the context is uh, you know it focuses on the advantages of nfc strategy in hearing aids uh, for speech uh, perception addresses uh, the specific challenges such as uh, you know effectiveness of different hearing aid strategies in various uh, listening conditions. So the objectives of this study is, the primary objective of this study is to you know, determine the advantages of nonlinear uh, frequency, you know, transposition strategy in hearing aids for uh, speech perception. So the specific goal uh, in this research is to, you know, evaluate speech perception as a function of uh, speech stimuli. So it was uh, the comparison performance uh, using conventional word list and high, high frequency word list. So the assessing uh, conditions were like investigating the speech perception in quiet and uh, uh, five decibel uh, signal to noise radio environments. <clears throat> So the participant focus in this study is the case study of a 69-year-old individual. It focuses on the participant with postlingual acquired uh, symmetrical bil uh, you know, bi uh, bilateral sloping high frequency. In the comparison of uh, hearing aid strategies are like conventional versus NFC settings uh, to compare the effectiveness uh, in enhancing the speech perception. The um, outcome measurement was uh, speech identification store uh, SIS testing was done and the qual qualitatively measures speech perception under uh, different conditions. Uh, different conditions as in noisy and uh, silent conditions. Coming to the methodology of this uh, study, a, a participant was a 69 year old individual. It was a postlingual acquired symmetrical bilateral sloping high frequency, which is uh, SNHL. Testing conditions were uh, like speech identification uh, score, uh, SIS testing, measure of speech perception. So the types of word list uh, in the conventional word list, uh, typically speech sounds and words. And in high frequency word list, words uh, focusing on high frequency sounds. So the listening environments like in the quiet environment, there is a standard quiet environment. And in the five decibel signal uh, to noise ratio, it is a background noise with a speech five decibel louder than the uh, normal noise. So the hearing aid settings was in conventional, the standard amplification is that and in non-linear uh, frequency, NFC, uh, advanced strategy, uh, you know, it was aimed to improve the high frequency sound uh, perception. So the results are quite interesting uh, in this paper. If you see the overview of the speech perception with conventional strategy in conventional word list, CWL, uh, the performance is greater uh, speech perception perception advantage uh, in detail, the participant performed better with uh, CW 
Hills, uh, showing higher uh, speech identification scores, SAS. And in high frequency wireless, the performance was noticeably you know, underperformance compared to uh, CWL. So in detail, a participant had uh, difficulty with high frequency sounds uh, leading to lower uh, SIS. Uh, the impact of listening conditions in quiet environment, uh, if you can see the result, uh, it was a better speech perception overall. In detail, the participant uh, scored higher in quiet conditions for both um, CWLs and HFWLs, but with a notable advantage uh, for uh, CWLs. In uh, noisy conditions, if you can see the results, uh, decreased speech perception. Uh, details, if you can see, both CWLs and HFWLs showed a lower ISS under noisy conditions with more significant drop of you know, HFWLs. Uh, so in NFC strategy, if you can see the overview of results in conventional wordless, the performance is a marginal improvement over conventional strategy, where if you can see the participant uh, uh, showed a slight uh, better speech identification scores with NFC compared to you know, conventional strategy. In condition of high frequency wordless, uh, the performance is significantly improved over the conventional strategy. Uh, if you see the details of participant, uh, you know, demonstrated much higher SAS with NFC, indicating better uh, perception of, uh, you know, high frequency sound. So the impact of listening conditions, uh, if you can see in two uh, environments, a quiet environment and louder environment. In quiet environment, if you see the uh, there were improved speech per. Uh, perception for both you know CWLs and HFWLs. Uh, in detail, if you can say NFC strategy led to you know higher uh, SIS in quiet environment with notable improvement of uh, HFWLs. In noisy conditions, uh, if you can see the results, less pronounced uh, disadvantage compared to you know, conventional strategy. In detail, if we can discuss, uh, although it is SIS decreased in uh, noisy conditions. NFC provided both scores for you know uh, CWLs and HFWLs uh, compared to you know conventional strategy. So if you can compare the conventional strategy uh, and uh, NFC strategy, the speech per performance uh, in conventional wordless, um, the strategy is higher performance in uh, quiet conditions, uh, uh, notable decline in uh, you know noisy conditions. In NFC strategy, marginal improvement in both quiet and uh, noisy conditions. So, if you can see higher frequency wordless uh, in conventional strategy, there is a significant underperformance uh, in both quiet and uh, noisy conditions. In NFC strategy, uh, there is a substantial uh, improvement uh, in both conditions. So, it, it was outperforming uh, conventional strategy. If you can see the comparison between two strategies. So in uh, listening conditions, uh, a variation, if you can see in quiet environment, if you can observe, uh, uh, the conventional strategy has a good performance with uh, CWLs, uh, poor with HFWLs. In NFC strategy, uh, it was improved performance for both you know, CWLs and HFWLs. But in no noisy conditions, if you can see the conventional strategy, the significant performance uh, drop from both word list and especially HFWLs. And in NFC strategy, uh, better performance, uh, retention, and less uh, pronounced uh, drop in uh, SAS scores. So if you can see the overall findings for CWLs, uh, both strategies perform you know, well in quiet conditions with NFC showing slight improvement. Both strategies show uh, reduced performance in noisy conditions, whereas uh, on the other hand, if we can see NFC performing better. In uh, uh, HFWL's uh, strategy, NFC strategy significantly outperforms you know, conventional strategy in both uh, quiet and uh, noisy conditions. So if we can conclude this uh, study, 
Uh, if you can summarize the findings, uh, this study basically demonstrated the NFC strategy in hearing aids uh, provides a significant improvement in speech perception for individuals with sloping high frequency, uh, which is uh, uh, SNHL. Notably, the NFC strategy outperformed the conventional strategy, particularly for you know high frequency word list uh, that is HFWLs across various listening conditions. Now, if you can see the implications for clinical practice, uh, these findings underscore the you know importance of considering advanced hearing aid strategies such as uh, NFC when designing treatment plans for individuals with you know so, uh, sloping high frequency, which is uh, SNHL. So clinicians uh, should prioritize uh, speech perception outcomes and you know uh, tailor hearing aid settings to you know optimize performance in different listening uh, listening uh, uh, environments so if you can see the future re uh, research uh, directions for this uh, research is that uh, it should explore the long term efficiency in nfc and uh, other advanced strategies in improving speech perception outcomes in diverse populations with hearing uh, uh, loss uh, in this uh, paper if you can see well, we have only uh, studied on one, uh, you know, participant. But in future, if we can, you know, uh, study on uh, multiple participants, we may get uh, improved results in uh, NFC strategies. And further investigation is, you know, warranted to evaluate the real world uh, effectiveness of NFC in everyday listening situations and its impact on overall communication and quality of life. So if we can make a closing uh, remarks on this paper, the findings of this study have significant uh, implications for improving speech perception outcomes and enhancing the quality of life for individuals with uh, you know, sloping high frequency, which is uh, SNHL. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you. Uh... I'm sorry, it is. 3.30 in the morning on the East Coast. So um, I appreciate you all dealing with my computer issues this morning. So I am a prosthodontist um, and I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. I'll be talking about maxillofacial reconstruction in um, two cases that I've worked with uh, my ENT colleagues here at the hospital about. And maxillofacial defects can occur from tumor resections, traumatic defects, bisphosphonate use, fungal infections, um, drug abuse, amongst other things. And most of these patients, unfortunately, end up with a lot of psychosocial issues. Um, they have facial deformities, unfortunately, in many cases, um, end up with a lot of speech issues, a lot of um, eating issues, and end up with a lot of anxiety and frustration. Um, and so it is very important to try to rehabilitate these patients in an adequate manner. The purpose of this lecture is to show two different head and neck reconstruction cases with significant challenges due to restricted interincisal opening. And many of these patients um, get radiation treatment and surgical reconstruction, and that causes a lot of interincisal um, deficiencies and anything less than 35 millimeters is considered restricted in which case it makes it difficult for me to be able to get into the mouth to make any prostheses. Trauma is the first case. Uh, this is a self-inflicted gunshot wound um, to the face that was reconstructed with a pectoris flap to the oral cavity, lower lip reconstruction with a full thickness flap um, excision. Uh, mandible fracture was reconstructed. There was still a root tip and um, a tooth that was left intact, but this is the patient after the reconstruction. And you can see that obviously their nose is still um, slightly disfigured and their mouth opening here is very restricted. And there was actually still an open communication between the maxilla and uh, the nasal cavity, making it difficult for this patient to um, eventually speak and be able to eat anything because food and stuff was coming in and out of their uh, nose as well. So in 1978, Dr. Aramani presented a classification of systems for maxillofacial defects in terms of occurrence. And 
you know, most frequent occurrence is uh, half of the maxilla being removed to the least common being just the area of the premaxilla that is being removed. And an obturator was required for this patient because it restores the partition between the oral cavity and the nasal cavity. And if they have a denture at times, it can be uh, utilized onto their denture to fabricate the final obturator. The functions of an obturator are to essentially seal the defect and it consists of a base and a bulb to seal the defect, but it helps in terms of rehabilitation of speech and function and can have a significant impact on a patient's life in terms of being able to go out and eat and speak and function normally. So these are very several cases that I've treated in the uh, hospital in terms of maxillofacial defects. And these are very difficult to try to restore in terms of stability and uh, retention and aesthetics and function. And in this patient, you can see that they had lost essentially a good amount of their maxilla. There's still a root tip retained and a wisdom tooth in their mouth and their mandible was reconstructed. So this patient ended up with being able to open only about two fingers width, which is very difficult to get inside to be able to make an impression. So I had to come up with a different uh, method in terms of being able to get inside the mouth to make this impression. So a custom tray was fabricated off of a very um, soft silicone putty that I basically just put into the mouth and molded to the roof of the mouth. And then that custom uh, tray would not fit well due to the limited intraincisal opening. So I had to suction the custom tray and essentially create it into two separate pieces and lock it in together outside of the mouth. So this method was util utilized, which was a new type of method in terms of the custom tray being cut and being put into the mouth one by one and an impression being made and uh, being put together essentially outside of the mouth. And magnets were utilized for the final obturator so that the patient could insert one at a time and be able to lock it in inside the mouth for it to function. So this was the final prosthesis in terms of one side being put in first and then the other side being put in second and the two being able to connect together in order to function interorally to allow the patient to be able to speak and eat. And this was the patient before and after. And my second case is based on a patient that has had head and neck cancer. Uh, she ended up with a large squamous cell carcinoma, of the left tongue resected with positive margins and had radiation and chemotherapy back in 2005. And she was uh, asymptomatic and had no problems from 2005 until 2017, when she showed back up with a chief complaint that there were loose teeth in her mouth um, and her general dentist did not have uh, comfort in taking these teeth out due to her previous radiation and medical history. And you can see on the x-ray here that there's this big gray, gray lesion here that shows that there was a big infection going on underneath these teeth and severe bone loss, meaning these teeth were very loose at the time. And she had ended up with osteo radionecrosis of those teeth and unfortunately had to have those teeth extracted. And the radiation treatment that she had had caused serious uh, collateral damage to her healthy tissue and had caused a lot of radiation fibrosis. Um, and the patient was not able to open very wide as a result of this. Um, which posed uh, issues moving forward in terms of our treatment as well. So she had ended up with having those teeth taken out and a fibula reconstruction done on the left side due to um, osteoradionecrosis and pathologic fracture um, at the time of the extractions. And she had done okay with this for a little while and said she had wanted some teeth um, to be able to chew well. And so we had placed some implants with the oral surgeon um, through a guide and had placed it ideally in this area so that she could have at least two teeth to be able to chew with on this side. And things had been going well for a little while until there was uh, some mobility again on now the contralateral side on the left side. 
And so we had had to evaluate this patient again. And it turns out that she had developed osteoradionecrosis on the contralateral side as well and had to have those teeth subsequently taken out. And you can see here the lip contracture that had been going on post radiation um, and the difficulty in the movement of her lip on that side. And we ended up having to do a fibular reconstruction on the contralateral side and essentially taking out her remaining teeth and placing implants so this patient could function and live a normal life again. And this was all surgically um, and prosthetically driven. And you can see that we tried to get as far back as we could, but because of her restricted opening, we couldn't get back any further. And you can see the lip contracture here, um, which was making it difficult for her to be able to speak very well um, and eat very well as well. But with the uh, placement of the implant, she was able to have some teeth. And this was for final prosthetic implant uh, denture. And then she came back and said that she couldn't really close her mouth very well because of the fact that the denture felt too big. And for me, it was difficult to get back in posterior to this area because she couldn't open her mouth very well. Um, and so I had to kind of redesign her prosthetic so that she could close her lip um, and be able to eat and drink so she wasn't drooling on that um, left side. And so we went back to the board and reduced her occlusal table and her occlusal plane and got everything moved a little bit um, more lingual toward the tongue so that I could actually get access to it um, with a restricted opening. And this has all been surgically driven when it was taken back to the lab and digitally um, transposed so that we could reduce everything and make a smaller prosthesis so that we could get it in and out of her mouth easier and that she would be able to close her lip. And so this is her final new one where you can see that her lip is actually able to close and there is a small little bit um, of opening unfortunately due to that contracted lip and scar tissue on that left side, but she's been able to function much better. And so there are always challenges with limited interincisal opening, unfortunately. Um, once some, most of these patients have radiation treatment um, and surgical reconstruction after trauma or um, cancer or other maxillofacial defects. Um, so it's really important in terms of certain options to be able to help with these patients uh, to get them to do oral therapy and physical therapy. And these Therabyte, Orobyte, and ArcJ appliances are simple ways that they can be able to open their mouth and not restrict their opening. And also do massage exercises um, and be able to just push on their roof of their mouth as well as their lower jaw to be able to um, stretch the muscles. And nowadays we're starting to do everything digitally. So we have been scanning for a lot of our obturators um, digitally and sending it to the lab. So that will be our um, latest research at the hospital to try to see if um, we can just use a camera to get in there to make impressions instead of having to do all of these things by hand. Thank you. Hello, I'm Min Sung Kim. Uh, I'm so grateful to all the audience who came in to hear my presentation. Uh, we are honored to present our research at such a large academic conference. Uh, this study was conducted with my research partner, Dong Hun Li, an audiologist, uh, while working at the hearing test room at Busan National University Hospital in Korea. Uh, my professor, Sugun Kong, MD of our ENT, is Korea's best expert on the Eustachian tube and has an outstanding talent for treating the Eustachian tube to the point that people can come from far away to receive treatment. Um, thanks to this, uh, we had no choice uh, but to become a specialist in the transfer evaluation. Uh, while conducting uh, numerous tests, 
tests, I discovered that among patients with normal tympanic membranes movement, there were far few people with normal ET function than expected. And I want to find out what proportion they accounted for. Uh, at the time, we were only conducting evaluations such as a um, Williams test, my inflation depression test, and tympanometry with snipping, like this. Uh, so we first tried to verify it using the test we were using at the time. Uh, currently, we are evaluating the function of the ETUF using more diverse evaluation tools. Uh, first of all, today I will explain the study on the evaluation of E2 function in ear with eardrum uh, using the Williams test. And this is my first time presentation in English, so I ask for your understanding, even if I am not good at presentation. Now I'll start. Uh, our title is Eustachian tube function test of normal ear in patient with unilateral colonic, colonic otitis media. Introduction. Uh, first, uh, unilateral colonic otitis media. Uh, the otitis media is condition in which the middle ear and mastoid are impairment inflamed for various reasons. Due to the structural reason of the mid-ear, it occurs bilaterally in infancy. Uh, but as age increases, the rate of unilateral otitis media increases, uh, reaching 85% for unilateral and 15% for bilateral. Uh, if there is a long-term problem with the open-close action of the e tooth, it has a significant impact on causing otitis media. The Eustachian tube is an organ that connected the nasopharynx and middle ear cavity. It opens and close, closes for 400 milliseconds and it's responsible for expelling foreign uh, substances, uh, ventilation, and pressure regulation in the middle ear cavity. Uh, there is a higher possibility that the E tube where otitis media occurs in not in good condition due to the effects on inflammation. Uh, however, the healthy etude of the patient uh, with urinatural otitis media may also be abnormal. Uh, in other words, patients with urinatural otitis media should also carefully examine the eustachian e tube. Uh, etude function test, the eustachian tube function test. Um, variety of methods uh, exist to evaluate, evaluate the etude. Uh, Barsalva, Toynbee, Franger, endoscope, endoscopy is a uh, uh, method methods uh, using uh, impedance of the metric, a Williams method or a direct method, a inflation differential test is auditory aerodynamic methods. Uh, among this, the Williams test, a uh, modified version of Bluestone's nine-step test is widely used clinically. Uh, in this study, use Williams test, uh, Y226 hertz, which is the stimulation frequency modified of the ex existing Williams test G660 hertz. Uh, that's why change the frequency to 
compensate for the problem of ocular pathology differentiation. Uh, this is a method that can check the condition of the eardrum with ear cavity and e tooth of the subject uh, with an eardrum and a relatively short test time, uh, maybe less than five minutes. Uh, this study, the purpose of this study was to examine the stachian tube function of the hair side of patient. A diagnosis uh, with urinary chronic autotismaria using real large test. Next, uh, experiment methods. Uh, among 229 patients who were diagnosed with urinary autotismaria on underwent surgery at the Department of uh, Otolaryngology at PNUH in 2000. 2019, uh, received type A in the tympanometry on the normal ear. Mm, there was less than 10 dB hearing airborne gap in pure, pure tone audiometry on the normal ear. Uh, subjects. Uh, satisfying the above conditions, 182 patients who did not have previous autotismedia or other autological or rhinological, uh, rhinological disease were retrospectively analyzed. Uh, there were 70 means and 112 women. The subject's age range for 10 to 82 years old, and the average age was 53 years old. Uh, the matters. Uh, this is the William test result. Uh, first, measure tympanometry in the comfortable condition. Uh, that's results is number one. A video plus 400 depapascal pressure presented to the external uh, auditor cane EAC and, and then dry swallowing twice. And temperature okay. That's number two. Uh, last. Uh, with a minus 400 depapascal pressure presented to EAC and dry swallowing twice again and tympanometry again. Uh, that's number three. Oh, that's something wrong with the presentation. Sorry. Uh, next, uh, we use the Tympath Pro to perform the, the Williams test. Uh, the test sound is 226 hertz and 75 dB SPR, and swift rate is 50 dB per sec. Measured in the total of three measurements, static compliance peak point. ATU mm. function test is number one. ATU uh, function test positive pressure is number two. Uh, it will function test and negative pressure is number three. And then uh, two swift were calculated. And the values of the two number of the added and divided by two are classified according to category and chronological analysis was performed. Okay. Now see the result. Uh, all people, uh, total 182 patient, uh, 17 patient are uh, in the 6 to 10 depapascal, 18 patient in 11 to 15 depapascal movement, and 22 patient 
are in 16 to 20 decapascular. And five patient in 21 to 25 decapascular. Uh, in previous study, result on um, one to five decapascular were often judged positive. But in this study, uh, we reject the one to five depapasker. Mm. In this study, so in this study, 62 cases showing change between six to 25 depapasker were considered to have normal movement, uh, which is 34% of the total patient. Excluding the 89 people who had no movement, the average values of the peak static compliance point of the 93 people whose eardrum moved, moved in the appropriate direction according to a presentation of negative and positive pressure are as follows. In a comfortable state, uh, in was minus five depapascal uh, when measured after presenting a positive pressure of plus 400 depapascal to the ex to the extra autocana, it was minus 20, uh, 27 depapascal. And conversely, when measured after presenting a negative pressure of minus 400 depapascal to the extra outdoor canal, it was plus 23 depapascal. Uh, uh, we can be learned from the experiment result. Among patients with unilateral otitis media, only 34% of the normal ear. Uh, although tympanum material type A, who were expected to have to no problem at all, uh, were found to be positive when performing the Williams test. Williams test. A patient with unilateral COM have a sixty-six percent having a bad A tube. Discussion. Uh, as conclusion, yeah. in general, uh, it is so the, thought the etiole function of the ear with autotis media is likely to be reduced and may previous study have proven it is. And this study confirmed that the function of the health side of patient with unilateral autotis media was also reduced at a high rate, 66%. Uh, this is similar results to the percentage of health eardrum, uh, ears with a problem uh, presented in the study that analyzed uh, the condition of the normal ear in patient with unilateral otitis media using CT. Uh, therefore, even for patient with unilateral otitis media, uh, e tube examination of the normal ear is necessary. Uh, discussion. The hearing test room at PNUH uh, continues to conduct research on the e tube even after this study and uh, submit two studies until last year. Uh, the first study, evidence characteristic of normal ear in patient with neurotrophic autism media is uh, very similar in this study. Uh, next, is second tube function test using sonotubal matrony. Uh, this is so exciting. Uh, to confirm the function of the second tube, on auditory aerodynamic approach along with physical uh, method in essential. Uh, as research continues, uh, 
It is continuous confirmed that each audiological evaluation was currently only a clear limitation. Uh, there is a need to additional conduct evaluation such as Williams test, inflation diffraction test, and so tubometry and TTAG uh, to measure tube function at all levels, uh, nasal cavity, atube, and medial cavity, and external auditor color. Uh, so I think we have to do more study about this atube, but we have to use all, all uh, all the evaluation we have to use, I think. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, then please contact me uh, via email. Uh, this email in here. So thanks again. Uh, I want to hope see you again. Thank you.